What's up guys, I'm Joey Salz. I'm here today with my good friend Clarity, and we're out to prove that people really do discriminate against other people because of the color of their skin. Hey, what's up? My phone just died on me. Is it all right if I use yours to call my girlfriend real quick? Uh, yeah, sure. Just unlock it. All right, thanks. It just picked me up at the parking lot. Here you go. Thank you so much, right. I appreciate it. Excuse me, so my phone just died. And I was wondering if I could just use it really quick and just make a quick phone call so I could tell my sister to come pick me up. Yeah, my phone just died too, man. I don't have my charger on me, so... Oh, your phone just died too? Yeah, I don't, I don't have my charger. So, I'm sorry, bro. All right, it's all right. Thank you. Help. All right, it's all good. Thank you. Uh, excuse me. Uh, my phone just died. Uh, I got to call my sister because I was waiting on my, making my kid up. Can I use your phone really quick? Dude, I'm trying to get servers. I have no servers here. I'm really trying to get this phone call. I'm sorry, bro. It'll just take two seconds. I, use. I mean, if I had service, I'd get All right. All right. Thank you. Right. Is it okay if you use your phone real quick? Uh, my phone died. I just got to call my girlfriend to pick me up. Uh, sure, dude. Thanks. At the parking lot right around the block. All right. Thanks. Thank Appreciate it. Uh, this might possibly be the dumbest thing I've ever done a conservative pastor in a conservative church talking about racism on the Sunday before the most volatile presidential election in recent history. But this is the story. As I've, as I've thought about it this week and kind of prayed over where the story leads us, this is, this is what God asks us to deal with, I think. You see, we've been asking, what kind of a church are we going to be? And we would love to fill in the blanks with our own preferences you have some words you'd love to put in there. I, I do as well. But rather than that, I mean, that'll just get us off course every time we do what we want. We're, we're going to the Word saying, Lord, um, how did your early followers, how did they live their life together? How should we fill in the blanks according to how you've led us? And, and today, we read a, a difficult story um, that's going to challenge us a bit. And the word we just have to fill in the blank here is the diverse church. What does it mean to be a diverse church? Now, I know. You've been on diversity committees at work before, and you're like, oh, man. So first of all, don't worry. We're not going to roll out a new mandatory diversity policy. Um, we're not going to plan a bunch of you know, um, events with churches that are different from us just so we can feel good that we've addressed the issue of diversity and move on even though nothing's really changed. We're, we're not going to offer you know, those easy corporate solutions. What we're going to do is a lot harder. We're just going to wrestle with a really difficult issue. Because the reality is, it's easy and natural to find friends who are just like us. That's what we do. It's natural. It's easy. It's not always bad. But, but in the process, a lot of folks get left out. And when we read how God invites us to live, it's usually not to take the easy or natural way out. And so, so what I want you to do today is to just wrestle with a very difficult issue, place yourself before God, ask yourself some difficult questions, questions that may go something like this, Lord, who are the people I avoid? Why do I do that? Lord, um, am I making a big deal out of what really you think are minor, unnecessary issues? So let's, let's wrestle today. In, in, a, in a Bible thinking kind of a way. Um, here's where we'll pick it up. Uh, Acts chapter 9. So if you're going to follow along, grab your Bibles, follow along. Um, we'll, I'll just reread one verse in 9 that'll help us get there, and then Acts 10 is where you should just, just kind of turn there. But Acts chapter 9, verse 31, we kind of pick it up here. We read this. Uh, the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace, and it was strengthened. Last week, we looked at a story in where the, the followers of Jesus, they were living in a time of intense persecution. It was not a time of peace. Saul was going after, ravaging the church, arresting people, persecuting the Christians. Then he has this vision where he sees Jesus alive and well, and he changes his mind about who Jesus is. Gives his life to Jesus. Persecution kind of comes to an end for a little while, and there's a time of peace. And during this time of peace, Peter, who's kind of the unofficial leader of the church, he decides, let's go visit 
um, the, the, the churches that have sprung up in the different parts of, parts of the country. And, and we, we've talked a couple of times, Jesus, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the last thing he said before he went up to heaven, he said, here's the plan, guys, here's the mission. You, my followers, you will be my witnesses here in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And the story we've seen so far was that in good times and bad, the message of Jesus has begun to spread. And as we can even see in this verse that I just read, it has spread to Judea. It's spread to Samaria. It's even spread to the region up north of Samaria and to Galilee. And it is on the edge of going worldwide. However, there is an issue in these followers of Jesus' hearts and minds that they are going to have to get through and get it right and we're going to see it here. The, mis- the, 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 the mission, and I'm really not just kind of over-dramatizing this too much. The mission could fail right here in this instance if they don't get it right and if God doesn't get a hold of their hearts and minds. It may never have gone worldwide to the ends of the earth if this wouldn't have happened right here. So here we go. Here's the story. Acts chapter 10. Here's the first scene to kind of hold in your mind. Verse 1, at Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion, in other words, a Roman soldier, Roman officer, in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all of his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need, and he prayed to God regularly. One day, at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, Cornelius stared at him in fear and said, What is it, Lord? he asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He's staying with Simon the tanner whose house is by the sea. When the angel spoke to him, had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and he sent them to Joppa. Now, here's something you kind of need to know to really kind of understand the story and the issue of what we're dealing with here. So, Cornelius was, he was not Jewish. He was Roman. He was a God-fearer which means he wasn't, he he was interested in God. He had a desire for the truth. He prayed regularly that we see, but he had not yet like fully converted to Judaism. There were some things that that would have involved um, and he would have had to submit to like all the laws and all the customs and all the traditions, but but he he was a God seeker, but he was still a Gentile. Now, if you're, you know, like like church person, you've heard that word a lot of times, and you may not have kind of understood everything it is, but, but it, it was a big deal to be a Gentile. You see, the early followers of Jesus, they were all Jewish. And they had this lifestyle given to them by God in their Bible, we call it the Old Testament, that had very strict rules of what it meant to be a godly person. And lines were drawn very clearly of like godly people and ungodly people. There were insiders and there were outsiders. There were clean and there were unclean people. And when you kind of divide up the world that way between us and them, you always put yourself in the us category. It's always the good people, the clean people, the desirable people, and everybody else is not. And, and, and then there were was, there was some reasons for that we could, we could get into. But there was us, godly people, the Jews, and there were the Gentiles, them, the rest of the world. The Hebrew word for the rest of the world, Gentile, in Hebrew was goyim. It translated into the nations. There's the one nation, us, and all the others. And goyim became a derogatory term to refer to the ungodly living in darkness, unclean people. And while Cornelius was a God-fearer who was interested in God, he was still clean. He was unclean. Stay away from him. We don't associate with unclean Gentiles because if we eat at their food and eat their Gentile food, we become unclean and then we can't go to the temple and we can't worship and we can't associate with our people and we're unclean and that's basically sinful and that's not good. So there's this line here. Us and them. Gentiles are them. Don't associate. God, though, shows up to Cornelius and he says, I've I've heard. I've been watching. I've been listening. And you're going to hear the greatest news ever. Hold that scene in your mind. Scene 2, verse 9. At about 9 
At about noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry, and he wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open, just try to imagine this now, and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. He's really hungry, his stomach is growling, and he has a dream. What do you think he dreams about? Food. Well, I mean, you know, in, in his time, you, like, you had to like, prepare food the hard way, like you had to do the whole process. And so he didn't dream about food, he dreamed about potential food. Here's, here's what he saw. In this sheet that he saw let down from heaven, verse 12, it contained all kinds of four-footed animals, potential food, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. What's this all about? Well, you see, Peter, living the, the, the customs and traditions that God had given the Jewish people, not only believed you know, that their like, people were clean and unclean, but certain foods were clean and unclean. Have you ever heard of kosher food? Kosher food is food that is clean, that is permissible by God to eat, and unclean food that is not kosher is unclean. And as, as, you know, as you may know, ham, bacon comes from a pig. A pig is an unclean animal, so you can't eat it. If you eat unclean food, you become unclean. You can't go to the temple to worship. If you associate with other, you know, other, other Jewish folks who are clean, they become unclean because you became unclean with them. And in fact, in fact, some folks even believed that, that if you took, this is crazy, if you take the, a Gentile tree, cut it down, use the wood to bake your bread, the bread becomes unclean. I mean, this is like, this is really the understanding they had. And so Peter's like, this is, un, I can't eat unclean, impure food. This dream can't be from the Lord. Verse 15, but the voice spoke to him a second time and said, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, just to, so he knew it wasn't just a fluke thing. It was purposeful. And immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. Now look at that verse 15. That, that's kind of a weird verse, right? Do not, make, do not call anything unclean or impure that God has made clean. And Peter thinks, wait a second, God, when did you make unclean food all of a sudden clean? And he realizes, if not now, then later, that this isn't so much about food as it is about people. And that when Jesus Christ gave his life for us on a cross... In some way that's hard for us Westerners to understand, his shed blood purified or cleansed us from the darkness and guilt of sin. That we, living our own way, doing our own thing, which we've all done, have lived unclean and impure, that we are impure before God, but that Jesus has made us clean. He says, Peter, don't call something or someone unclean that I have made clean. He's preparing himself, preparing me for what, what's going to happen. Verse 17, continue on here. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of this vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped by the gate. See what God's doing here? He's preparing him for a lesson, not about food, but about people. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We've come from Cornelius the centurion. He's a righteous and God-fearing man who's respected by the Jewish people. An angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. And so, so, so now we have a moment here. We have an opportunity. What is Peter going to do? He has been invited to go into the house of an impure, unclean 
Gentile. Someone he has been taught his whole life to stay away from, or he will be unclean. Will he risk his reputation? Will he risk what he's, will he change what he's believed for so long? Here's how it goes. Verse 23. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. Well, so far, so good. He invited some Gentiles in. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. They want to see what's going to happen here. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them, and he had called together his relatives and close friends. In other words, a whole house full of goyim. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him. He fell at his feet in reverence, but Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I'm only a man myself, which is a great way to make friends. I'm only a man myself, and so are you. Verse 27, while talking with him, Peter went inside. He found a large gathering of people. He said to them, I love his honesty here, right? At least he's honest. You're well aware it's against our law for a Jew to associate or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me I should not call anyone impure or unclean. He got it. He got the message Jesus was trying to teach him. So when I, sent, when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent me? Cornelius answered, Three days ago I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who's called Peter. He's a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good for you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Huh, what a great opportunity. He's like, I got a whole house full of people. We're searching the truth. We've been praying. Tell us about Jesus. A whole house full of people. What a great opportunity. Peter's like, man, where do I start? And here's what's really wonderful about this. Right here, what we have in the next paragraph is like the core of what we believe about Jesus. This is the core of what it means to be a Christian. If you're wondering to yourself, you know, how do I understand Christianity, this whole Bible, there's so much to read. Like, just circle this section here. Dog ear the page in your Bible so you can come back at it. This is the core and the central belief about everything we mean, we know it is to be a Christian. And what you do is you want to read through this later, look for the word that is repeated most often, and then you'll know what's absolutely essential about following Jesus. So Peter, he just starts up here. Verse 34, then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing so, healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Now, we are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He wasn't just a spirit. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God has appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify, testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. There you go. That's the focus. That is the core of what it means to, to, to be a follower of Jesus. That's the core of our message that God has done something great through Jesus and it, will, and it affects your life, bringing forgiveness of your sins and hope and future for you. Let's go back. Um, verse, uh, verse 36, or what's the one I have in the next slide there? I think it is. Verse 36. This is kind of the one, I mean, this is really good news here. We just read this out loud with me? Read it with me. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ who is Lord of all. 
Man, there's so much there. You just take some time and like focus in on each one of those words. Peace, the message of peace. Oh, we'd love for a message of peace. Your neighbors, your coworkers, the people who live around you are looking for a message of peace. Maybe you came to church today and you're looking for a message of peace. Where do we find it? It's not a where, it's an in whom do we find it, and that is Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, who is Lord over all. And for the last 2,000 or so years, followers of Jesus have found that when we give our lives to Jesus, that we say, Jesus, you are Lord, you're leader of my life, we experience peace. We experience the forgiveness of our sins and our guilt and shame from the things we've done. We experience hope for the future, for the rest of our lives, and into eternity. And we follow Jesus. And we live this life that's better than we ever could have imagined. This is the good news of Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you're, you're kind of like Cornelius and his friends. You're seeking truth and you're seeking peace and you've been praying, but you've been looking for the, the full message. This is it right here. One of the best things you could do today before you go home is to say, that's me, God. Do, do this to me. God, forgive my sins. God, come into my life and lead my life. It's the best decision you'll ever make. And before you go home today, if that's you and God's working in your heart, I'm going to invite you to give your life to Jesus. Here's what happened to Cornelius and all his friends and relatives gathered in his house. Verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. Whole house. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished. I love this part here. I mean, look at, look at, their, look at their thoughts, right? Look at this prejudice. This, I mean, this is crazy. They were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. Can you imagine that, that God would even accept those Gentiles? You see, when you've been raised and reinforced to think one way that this group of people, they are just, uh, it's, it's hard even when you see it. But, but look at how they, I mean, Peter, he's just like, verse 46, where they heard them speaking in tongues, we, they heard them praising God, we can't deny it. Then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They've received the Holy Spirit. Look at this phrase, really important. Just as we have. We receive the Holy Spirit, they receive the Holy Spirit. There's only one Holy Spirit. We've got the same Holy Spirit. Look what God's doing. Even the Gentiles are welcomed in God's kingdom. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Tell us more, Peter. Help us grow because we want to follow Jesus. Help us to take those first few steps and get us started on this path of following Jesus for the rest of our lives and their lives are changed. And here is what happens. The mission of Jesus now crosses over to the rest of the world. Had Peter messed up this one and said, I just can't go there. I can't accept these Gentiles. It would have hindered. It would have stopped the spreading of the message. But God works in Peter's own heart and life. Now, now he doesn't get it perfect. Later on, we're going to see a story where he, where he struggles and he's in a situation where there's both Jews and Gentiles in the same room and he's like, do I sit at that table or that table? And it's a classic middle school lunchroom thing. You're, you're like, how do I handle this? And he gets it wrong and he's confronted on it and he says, you're right, I got it wrong. He's going to wrestle with it as, as we need to wrestle with it too. But at this point, it crosses into all the world and it's going to continue, and it's beautiful that all people everywhere get to receive Jesus, Amen. including you and me, a whole room full of Gentiles. Here's a way to think about it. When you give your life to Jesus, one of the ways the Bible describes that is you are adopted as son or daughter of Jesus. See, sin is like doing your own thing, going your own way, running away from home. And you, you've all done that. We've all been there. But God came and found us and brings us home and invites us to come back home. And he adopts us as sons and daughters. Now, let's take that to its full conclusion, right? So if I've received Jesus and I'm adopted as his son, and Clyde has received Jesus and adopted him as his son as well, then Clyde and I are, do the, do the logic here, Brothers.
And if I'm adopted as a son of God, Sarah gives her life to Christ. She's adopted as a daughter of God. We are brother and sister. When you give your life to Jesus, you're adopted as a son or daughter of God. Welcome to the family. And we are in the one family of God with one Father. We're family. And all of the divisions, the things that seem different, we speak different languages, still one family. We eat different kind of foods, have even some lifestyle differences. You're following Jesus with your heart, I'm following Jesus with all my heart, we're family. And that means the church is very diverse. And sometimes that's hard to deal with. It's not always easy. But could it be that we followers of Jesus could lead the way in embracing people who are very different from us, but saying we can live with differences and embrace each other in unity? Could we be leaders even in our own culture? I mean, let's be honest, we want to value diversity, but it's not easy. I came across a, a, a blog post about a month ago or so that has forced me again to wrestle with a difficult issue. I want to read a part of it to you, and I'll, I'll, I'll post it to Facebook later on. You can read the entire thing. As a white mother of two black children and three white children, I have something to say. Racism exists, it's real and tangible, and it's everywhere all the time. When I brought my boys home, they were the cutest, sweetest babies ever. ever. Wherever we went, people greeted us with charm and enthusiasm. Well, not all people, not everywhere, but to me, they were the wacko exceptions, and I thought to myself, get over it. Now, my boys look like teenagers, black teenagers. Let me ask you these questions. Do store personnel follow your children when they are picking out their Gatorade flavors? They didn't follow my white kids. Do coffee shop employees interrogate your children about the credit card they are using while you are in the bathroom? They didn't interrogate my white kids. When your kids trick or treat dressed as a ninja or a clown? Do they get asked who they're with and where they live, door after door? My white kids didn't get asked. Do your kids get pulled out of the TSA line time and again for additional screening? My white kids did not. Do your kids get treated one way when they're standing alone, but treated a completely different way when you walk up? I mean a completely different way. My white kids didn't. Do shoe salespeople ask if your kids' feet are clean before sizing them for shoes? No one asked me with my white kids. Do complete strangers ask to touch your child's hair or ask if they are from druggies? No one did this with my white kids. The reason why the phrase, all lives matter, is so offensive to black people is because it isn't true. Right now, my black children are treated differently than my white children. So when you say all lives matter as a response to the phrase black lives matter, you are completely dismissing the near daily experience of racism for those with pigment in their skin, curl in their hair, and broadness of their nose. I'm posting this so you can see the reality I have witnessed and experienced because, frankly, I didn't believe it was true until I saw it up close, directed at two souls I love over and over again. So please, use this post as a pair of glasses to see the racism that surrounds you. Then we can actually make progress toward all lives being valued and cherished. And that's not easy to read. Interestingly enough, someone came out to me and said, after last night's service, said, thanks for dealing with that because I had the same experience myself. Even here in nice, comfortable, white bread Ridgefield. 
We value diversity. This is it's not easy. We've got to wrestle. But if anybody ought to be able to lead the way, it ought to be us followers of Jesus. Amen. We're not going to get it perfect every time. But we have the blessing of being able to repent and ask for forgiveness and reconciliation. Can we lead the way? Can we begin to overlook some issues that really aren't all that important? And to be as diverse as we need to be, to welcome all, to welcome everyone, as together we seek the Lord. So last weekend after our Saturday night service, I, I stayed, um, went downstairs and worship with our Hispanic congregation. They meet at uh, 8 p.m. on Saturday nights. I, man, I felt a little out of place. I, don't, I only know one word in Spanish, and, but they never said hi in any of the songs or the preaching, so I didn't understand any of it. And, it, you know, Pastor Lauren, he preached a great message. I'm not sure what it was all about, though, because I didn't understand any of it. In, in one of the worship times, we're singing, and I'm like, I think I know that line. I think I can kind of figure it out from a couple other languages I've kind of studied before. I think it means something about raising my hand. So I got my phone and I Google translated it real quick and like, oh yeah, that's what it means, raising my hands. Oh yeah, people around me, they probably thought I was, you know, playing on Facebook or something. I was like, no, I'm translating it so I can try to really, you know, feel like I'm a part of this. At the very end, well, I kind of knew what was coming, right? We were all seated in a big giant circle and in the middle, there was, a, there was a tray with some cups in it and a basket with some bread. So I kind of knew what was coming. And when he called up two leaders, two men came, one took a cup of, or took the tray of cups and the other man took the bread and walked around the circle. They served me one of each. And as we ate and drank, and received the body and blood of our Lord Jesus. We didn't need language. We were together, receiving the same body and the same blood of the same Lord Jesus Christ, and together we worshiped. Even though communication was almost impossible, we were communicating and worshiping together. It was beautiful. And one of the things about following Jesus and being part of a church family. So we gather every week, and even though a lot of us are the same skin color, there's still a lot of diversity. And when we worship together, we say, one Lord for all of us. So today we're going to conclude by celebrating the Lord's Supper and receiving communion together. I'm going to invite our worship team if you would come on back and as, or come on back up here as, as, as we distribute the elements we're going to sing together. Um, here's how we celebrate uh, communion here at Ridgefield Nazarene. You don't have to be a member. You don't have to get approval from the pastor to, to celebrate communion. We only ask one thing and that is that you are trusting in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and for your life and future. And maybe even as we've worshipped, you know, you said, man, I'm, I'm like the Cornelius. I, I've been seeking God, been seeking truth, and I need to give my life to Jesus. Wouldn't it be great today if your first, your first act of following Jesus is to physically receive the body and blood of Christ? I mean, what a great symbol of inviting Jesus to come into your life and to receive the body and blood of Christ. And so today, maybe God's working on your heart. Maybe today's the day to give your life to Jesus. If you'd like to do that, I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer just, just to kind of put this decision to words. And if that's where you are today and that's your part of your response, I want you just to pray this with me. Here's, here's that prayer. Just, just pray with me if this is what God's doing in your life. Heavenly Father, I choose to receive Jesus into my life. I'm open for you to change me. I desire to begin a new relationship with you. Cleanse me from sin. Put your spirit in me. Take the lead in my life. Amen. The promise of Jesus is that he's already taken away your sin and guilt. He's already prepared a place for you in heaven. 
and he will lead you faithfully. I'm going to invite you to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Let's stand together. Um, ushers, would you come forward? And here's, here's how we will uh, here's how we'll dis- distribute the, uh, the, the elements together. So we'll have two ushers, uh, one for each section. And I'll ask that uh, one in each section, one usher will hold the bread, one will hold the, the juice, and they'll stand kind of in the center of each of these sections. And then when they're ready, you can just, everybody walk to your left, come down the aisle, and then receive one cup and one piece of bread, hold them, and we'll eat and drink together, and then just continue on, go back to your seats. When everyone has been served, then we will, we will eat and drink together. We also, for those who, uh, who, have, uh, who, have, who need gluten-free, we have gluten-free bread, and uh, I'll ask Pastor Scott, would you... Uh, would you stand here, and if, uh, if you need gluten-free bread, come find Pastor Scott, and he has the, uh, has the bread. So, all right, come on forward, uh, work your way to the left, come on down, and be served, and then we'll eat and drink together.
the Lord himself ordained this holy sacrament. He commanded of his disciples to take of the bread and wine or juice as emblems of his broken body and his shed blood. This is his table. The feast is for his disciples. And so let all those who with true repentance have forsaken their sins, who have believed in Christ for salvation, draw near and take these emblems and by faith partake of the life of Jesus Christ to your soul's comfort and joy. Let us remember that this is a memorial of the suffering and the death of Jesus and a token of his coming again. And let us not forget, especially as we've learned today, that we are one at one table with one Lord Jesus Christ. If you would take the bread, let it be for you the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was broken for you, May it preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you. You may eat. Take the cup. Look into it. May it be for you the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ which was shed for you. And may it preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Drink in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. You may drink. Again, Lord, we say thank you. And I pray for all of us today that we would be reminded of your powerful presence in our lives, of the great work that you've done for us, Lord, encourage some of my friends today with a reminder that you are always faithful and you will continue to be faithful. And Lord, as followers of Jesus, bring us together to be one. We are yours and your family. It's in your name we pray today. Amen. And if today you have prayed to receive Jesus as Lord, welcome to the family of God. It's the best decision you'll ever make. If we can help you in any way, we want to do that. I'm going to go to the back and greet folks as they leave. Um, a couple of our pastors, they'll hang out here around the front. Come find one of us and say, hey, I gave my life to Jesus. We'll pray for you. We'll encourage you. We'll help you to take the next steps along the way. We are, uh, we're really late today, so I think we'll just be dismissed, and the band's going to play out a really great song behind us. You can sing along with them if you want. But uh, have a great week, and let's go see what God does. You're dismissed. <laughs>